Hello and welcome to another episode of Steezo Dreamcraft, the podcast that provides you with the information, knowledge, and wisdom to be a more effective cybersecurity leader. My name is G. Mark Hardy. I'm your host for today, and I got a really special guest that I'm sure you're going to enjoy. Her name is Olivia Rose. She does the CISO work. She runs the Rose CISO Group. And if you are a CISO, you need to hear what she has to say, because what I understand is that she doesn't pull any punches. And I think that would be great to hear it directly from someone with a lot of experience. So without further ado, welcome to the show, Olivia. Well, hi. Hi, everybody. Thank you for having me here. It's great to be here. And um, yeah, after 21 years in this industry, I really don't pull any punches. <laughs> I just say I whatever. Long time I, for why. I mean, I'm thinking like, well, where's your gray hair and things? <laughs> I get, it. I get my hair dyed. Yeah, okay. Don't you worry about that. that. I, but, I take care of it. But then that works out well. But yeah, so we've been doing cybersecurity, each of us, for quite a while. And we've seen the industry grow and change and move uh, around a lot. But for our audience to, they can understand a little bit about you, is tell me a little bit about your background. Uh, you know, you're know, you currently running an organization called the Rose CISO Group. But tell me about how, what you did in your experience and then what led you to start this. Well, uh, I started off in marketing way, way, way ago, but that was for internet security systems, ISS, one of the first. Remember them. Right? In Atlanta. And they were a great company until we were bought out by IBM, but never mind. Uh, <laughs> so I was in marketing and then I moved to the consulting group there, I stayed in consulting and then became a CISO for MailChimp here in Atlanta, and then the CISO for Amplitude uh, in, this, in the Bay Area. Uh, and then after Amplitude, I was so burned out that I was interviewing for CISO roles, but I just thought, what's a way that I can take some time off and make a buck at the same time? And that was advisory CISO stuff, because that's what I know. Uh, and then, boom, the, right out of the gate, hit my stride a year and a half ago. Uh, and it's been, I, I, I don't think I could go back to being a CISO. I mean, my stress is like half of what it was. <laughs> I make actually more money than I made being a Bay Area CISO mm -hmm. for a SaaS company. <laughs> uh, and my time is completely open. Yeah, it sounds like a win-win-win all around, which it's of course- but he say like, why would I ever want to be a CISO when I could be a VCISO? Well, of course, we're not trying to get anybody to quit your job. That's not the point <laughs> of the show. But what we're trying to help you understand, though, is because I do VCISO work as well. And so as a result, I can time split between multiple clients. I've also got time to do the podcast, plus do consulting, keynote speeches, because I got that face for radio. And when you build this portfolio around things that you're good at, that are valuable to other people, that you actually kind of enjoy... Although the money is nice, it's not the driving factor. If that also happens to be better, that's a real bonus. It's a shit. I mean, it, it's the cherry on the pie. I mean, it's, it's nice, right? It's cherry on top of the Sunday, I should say. You know, and, and I'm, yeah, I, I'm doing the keynote speaking. I'm doing the um, expert witness stuff, which is fun as well. I'm starting up a big mentorship program with a big security industry very early next year, which I'm excited about. Um, because I did one for another organization, which was highly su successful. And I'm able to do all these things without stressing out about time. Mm -hmm. Because one thing that being a VC so teaches you is make sure you manage your time very well. And because you manage your time very well, you are then able to identify big windows, chunks of windows where you can do all these other things. And yeah, that's real good insight because a lot of times when we're in an organization, there's all this friction the drag that comes in there. Oh, we got an all employee meeting at 11 o'clock. Oh, we've got this thing here. Oh, you have to do this training and things such as that. And in any type of organization, you're going to have that overhead. It's really just kind of comes with the package. But what's interesting is for those who've never been in business for themselves, when you start your own business, you find out those actually are replaced with a number of other things, for example. Unless you've got a really good outsourcing model, you're going to be writing your own proposals. You're going to be chasing down your own payables. You're going to be depositing things. You're going to be making your own coffee and also coming up with ideas for what comes next and, and building out deliverable sets, et cetera. So it's not free and clear. It's not like you just sit back and the whole world beats a path to your door. You actually have to go out there. But what you do find out, though, is, as you point out correctly, you're in much more in control of what it is you're doing. 
If it's of importance to you, you do it. If you enjoy it, you do it. Now, if it turns out that you got too much going on and in the pre-show we were talking about, you're like, I don't need more publicity. I have more work than you can get to. It's a great problem to have. It's yeah, a terrible problem. <laughs> yeah, it's like one of those things you're like, oh, throw, don't throw any more business my way. <laughs> but what we find out is that once you are successful at something and people know you're successful at it, they want more of you. And they want more of you simply because you've demonstrated an ability to manage your time effectively, to deliver value mm -hmm. based upon the expertise that you've had. But one of the important things to remember for anybody who wants to strike out on their own, and any CISO understands this, is you can't just rest on your laurels. You have to constantly be learning, constantly be educating. And when you talk about mentoring, I, I work with some folks, I don't want to call them kids, but they're not, they're, they're college age and just shortly beyond. But at some point in time, when you look down on these people in their 20s, you're like, yeah, they kind of look like that. <laughs> but what, what I'm finding, though, is that many people see a general direction they want to go in, but they don't really have a very discreet path. Right. There's nobody who has laid out, do this, then this, then this, then this, then this. They just kind of want to go in this general direction. So how do you help somebody who has expressed some interest to you? And I, they come to you and said, Olivia, I'd like to get into cybersecurity. I want to do this or whatever, but I'm not sure how to start. What recommendations would you offer? I've had this conversation. I, I can't even tell you how many times. I, I can't. Um, I have posted this on LinkedIn many times. And it's there have been a couple of my most uh, popular posts. It, it, funny enough, this is a very hot topic. Mm -hmm. I don't think entry-level jobs in cybersecurity exist today. I mean, you have a SOC analyst role. However, the majority now, when they look for people to fill their SOC analyst roles, they're now looking for um, a couple of years experience. They're not true entry-level jobs. So there's a complete lack of these honest to goodness, real entry level jobs, meaning you go to school and get your certificate, whatever you do, and then you do everything right. And then you met, you get lucky, you meet a good contact and you get your first entry level job. Those, those don't exist anymore. And they haven't existed for two to three years, which is why we have this gut, a glut of all these folks coming out of these schools and education programs who can't find jobs. Um, and it's a, it's a really sad to see because I see just hundreds of these, of these kids, I call them kids too, okay. who just have done everything right, but they can't fi find jobs. They're frustrated. So I always say to people, don't go into cybersecurity, go into IT, go into something else, find a good, stable company with good leadership and they exist, <laughs> and find a company like that and get any job you can, even if it's admin assistant, even if it's IT coordinator or facilities coordinator, find something because once you're in there for five to six months, you're then able to kind of trot over to where the uh, security people sit uh, or where they hang out and get to know them. And they already know you. So the minute that they want to hire somebody new, they'll bring you on because they would rather hire you because you're awesome and cool and dedicated and driven and asked to shadow their meetings and stuff. So they see that you want to learn and you learn quickly. They'd rather hire you than somebody that they have to take a chance on. And that's that's some very, very good insight. But first, you're talking about this and the lack of entry level jobs, I'm thinking, Airline pilots, you can't just go ahead and said, hey, I just went to every riddle and I want to go fly a 747. Yeah. Well, no. I mean, if you join the military, you get a lot of stick time that way. Or when I, you know, I got my private license, but my friend who was my instructor was a military officer, but he was trying to build up his dual engine hours so he could get started somewhere. And maybe you fly for a regional airline and you work your way up. But the point is, is that you don't start at the top. And in this particular case, it's not that I think people have closed the doors, but you'd mentioned it was about two to three years. Do you think that COVID and the lockdowns changed that job? What was it that made that shift? I think it's uh, budgets. Budgets got 
got slashed, headcount got slashed. COVID, of course, did have a an impact leading mm-hmm. to that happen. And you know, when I was a CISO, if I'm if I'm if I can hire one person, who am I going to hire? I'm going to hire somebody who's got two to three years experience over somebody who's entry level. I mean, that's how business works. Mm-hmm. So, I think. That is honestly what happened. But the problem is, is, and I'm probably going to upset some people by saying this, but think about it because it is true. <laughs> people, the kids are being told in colleges and these programs that there's such this lack of jobs in cybersecurity that they're going to get a job within two minutes, especially if you're female, especially. And it'll be six no. figures start with bonus six design top. start, right? And it's not true. And, but what happens is, is that these cybersecurity people get so entrenched in this exciting world of cyber that they don't want to do anything else. They refuse to look left. They refuse to look right. They refuse to go into IT. They refuse. I There was some one, there's one woman who got a job offer at a great company through a friend of mine, and it was for like a chief of staff role, but she wanted to go into GRC. Didn't take it. <laughs> so look left, look right. There's so many jobs out there. Just get, a, get one at a good company. And the other thing also is that a lot of these educational programs, you'd mentioned that. So I've taught uh, as adjunct faculty at the master's level, as a, I taught at Sands Institute for about a decade, and a little bit different worlds out there. And usually SANS and the degree granting institutions have a key difference in that if your certification, you can change your curriculum fairly rapidly, there tends to be a more ossified process that goes with the .edu. And in a world like cybersecurity, where half of everything you know is going to be obsolete in 18 months, it's a little bit hard to keep up with that. But I talked to one, in fact, it was a young lady a couple of years ago who was getting her degree and she said, I got a 4.0 in this cybersecurity degree. And I thought, this is great. And she was looking for job ideas and job prospects. Well, I know a lot of people and I know places for that. So what I did is I, I met with her. In fact, I had to fly out to the airport. So she met me at the airport. And I came up with, I think, eight questions. Basically things that I thought would be pretty straightforward. But you talk about IT, such as uh, what protocol would you expect to see at the network layer? Okay, um, how about on a uh, TCP IP header? Oh, um, really? what, what are those? Oh, and I went through what I thought was a bunch of things. It says um, a Bluetooth, can you, you know, if you have multiple things, can I, how many devices can you connect on Bluetooth? Seven, if you got the right chipset. And, and some other things, she was 0 for 8. And I told her, I said, I'm not going to mention the name of the educational institution, but I said, I think that they sold you a bill of goods. They blew sunshine at you. They gave you a 4 all. They gave you a degree. They didn't teach you anything. Because if that 4 all represents you reflecting back to them the material that they thought was important enough to test on, and you don't even understand how a network works or how a protocol works or how these things are communicating and stuff like that, how in the world are you ever going to be successful in IT security? You need to go back and fill in those fundamental basics. And so... The question that we used to ask several years ago when there were no cybersecurity degrees, how do you get somebody into the career pattern? My first choice would be, give me a network engineer. Give me somebody who understands working communications well, because I can teach her a lot of the cyber stuff on top of that. But even if you come in sideways and other people say, well, I don't want to get too technical. Okay, do GRC. Yeah, Yeah. but at least understand that the fundamentals, (laughs) that's sort of that run beneath it. And so that could be either be from a .edu educational program or it could be a cert. And it may not have to be a security cert. It could be one of the basic level ones that are out there that help people get going. But invest in yourself if you are a person trying to get into the career. And if you are a CISO or somebody in the role of a mentor, be willing to ask those tough questions of somebody to say, can you do answer this? And if they don't know the stuff, put them on a program of study mm-hmm. and yeah. give them that opportunity. And yeah. if someone pushes back, I had an Uber driver in the San Francisco Bay Area when I said, told him what I did. He said, oh, I want to get to cybersecurity. Here, it pays really well. How do I, how do, I do this? And I said, 
<laughs> I, well, when he, I said, cybersecurity is like the National Football League. Same thing. He said, what? I said, yeah, got to have a lot of natural talent and you work your tail off every day. And you do that for a few years, you can make good money. Yeah. Well, it's not what he wanted to hear. And of course, they didn't say this, but I think that's why you're still driving an Uber. But <laughs> the, the point was, is that some people think this is a, a open riches story and you can do really well and once you get into the career pattern it's very satisfying as we know but you can't burn out it can just overload you because it's insatiable there will always be one more problem there's always be one more always. to make always, always thing you have to do and things such as that uh but for those of us who are working as CISOs or maybe even contemplating rb CISOs, let's talk about a couple tactics or techniques that might help in the career and one of them is being able to talk to a board now i remember 10 years ago you know, the board, they existed, all right? And maybe, just maybe, uh, I think it was Kim Jones at Banta was sort of the super CISO because he was able to come back and says, I get to talk to the board twice. <laughs> and he's going, oh, five right. minutes. <laughs> and actually, it's five minutes. We was bragging about the five minutes because if you need five <laughs> minutes, it means you're not cl clear and they have to keep asking questions. But if you're clear <laughs> and you get it all done in five minutes and they say, all right, you're in charge. <laughs> Aren't you to charge? You know what you're doing. How much money you want? Okay, good. See you in six months. That's actually not a bad place to be today. The boards are going to have that on their list of things they have to do. The SEC regulations and the changes that have taken place require that awareness. They did not put into the SEC regs a requirement for cyber knowledge at the board level. Although there is one for financial, you'd think there would be cyber. Maybe someday there will be. And of course, some of us are thinking, well, I should be on a whole bunch of boards. Let me go up and call up Exxon and 3M and things like that. It's like, no, you're not the person they want. They want somebody who has been running a couple billion dollar P&L for a few years. Well, mm -hmm. okay, now you can tell us about cyber. Oh, you're going to somebody who has done this and maybe served at a very high level in the U.S. government. Okay, now you can buy this in cyber. But for the most part, if you've been running your IT security team and you've worked your way up to CISO in this regard, that's not board level stuff. So how do we communicate to the board? What's different about the language that you use? And what's a good strategy for how much to say without saying too much or getting in trouble? Well, the key is to know who, who's on your board. Really understand who is on your board by individual, mm -hmm. right? Um, and many people have given that advice, but I like to go into it deeper, such as what is their level of understanding of technical and what security technical mm -hmm. and what's their level of understanding of security governance risk compliance uh what's their comfort level but going to it even deeper than that when you look at somebody's linkedin page you can kind of usually tell you can pick up the clues as to what makes up this person what makes mm -hmm. them tick some people are very verbose. I mean, the, the, whole th the whole thing is just writing, 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 writing. No pictures. That's someone who likes a lot of detail and who likes to read. They like to mm -hmm. read materials and assume their own opinions first before they're told. They're not going to sit there and listen to you. Um, you can see what they're, what makes them tick when it comes to uh, understanding of I mean, what's important to them in the world? Uh, what kind of industries have they been in? What have they possibly seen? And once you get that kind of information, you glean all of that, that little micro, you know, the micro data about each person, mm -hmm. you're then able to present to the board and you include something for everyone. So if somebody is more of a visual person and you can pick that up from presentations they've done, you can, if it's very image heavy and not many words, right? If they're LinkedIn, it's very few words and lots of pictures. Include lots of pictures. Provide the 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 note the, the notes and, and the deck before the meeting for the people who like to read and gather in their own information. Uh, you can often tell when somebody's an introvert or an extrovert, and that's really important. If somebody there are a lot of people out there who post pictures of themselves going to all these events. Mm -hmm. May not be an extrovert, but this is someone who is comfortable to speak up in front of other people. Then you have the people who are, you know, never go on LinkedIn. 
really don't have much of a presence. More likely the ones that like, you know, they'd like to kind of sit back and watch observers. Mm -hmm. you, you have to generalize a little bit like this. So once, so once you're in the meeting, uh, I design your presentation to appeal to both. So you give the folks who, uh, you, of course, you give to everyone. Don't <laughs> pick out that you think is an introvert. But you give to everybody uh, the deck beforehand because the introverts are going to want to read it and absorb it first to come up with questions. The extroverts are the ones who look at it quickly and just speak right off the bat. Um, so that's something that's not really talked about that often. Uh, the, the, the board as individual people and what makes them tick. Then, of course, you've got the deck itself. I mean, it can be five to six slides at the most. Um, and there's lots of information out there about this, but it's it's literally answers the questions question, are we going to be breached? And have we been breached? And the answer to both is, I don't know. And I hope not. I mean, it's you can't say yes or no to either of those, right? <laughs> or else, right? Um, so you go along those lines of giving them all right, this is where we're at. This is what's gone on in our industry out there. Recent breaches, what have we learned from those breaches that we've applied to ourselves? And then you move into, well, this is where we're at with our program. Uh, and this is where we want to be. And we're working on these types of initiatives and focus areas. But you don't talk about them as the work streams and initiatives at the ground level. You roll them up to what matters to the business, which I know you want to ask about. Exactly. <laughs> stop, stop there. It, it, it's a good point because it's important to know at what level to have a conversation. If you're sitting here with talking with your technical folks, it's okay to get in the bits and bytes and things like that. If you're talking to non-technical peers, that is, you're working laterally in there, you're talking more about business initiatives, risk, and things like that. If you're talking to C-level executives, what you're looking for is operational details. How is this going to help us make this deadline or not? Are we going to be on that? But at the board level, the board is ultimately concerned with the risk and accomplishing the overall strategy of the organization. They task the CEO, they task the other C-level executives with getting that vision accomplished. But at the end of the day, that needs to come from up top. So there, as you're right, you would shed the technical detail, you would shed the pure stuff, even the operational detail, and focus longer. Now, you had said are we breached and are we likely to be breached? But I think it goes beyond that now. And what we've seen with the SEC requirements that have come out this past year and some of the other regulations coming out from California and then also other uh, jurisdictions is that compliance is becoming even more of a concern because uh, to a certain extent, a multi-billion dollar or euro fine is probably equally destructive as some sort of a ransomware event in terms of the financial impact and now the damage is being done to you by the very entities that were supposed to be there in the first place to help protect you because we vote for governments and we create them and primary goal of the government should be the safety of its own citizens. So how do we deal with that at the board level then as CISOs? Because if we're not in charge of GRC and not all CISOs are, right? how fluid do we need to get in that area and how do we do so without crossing the wires and getting into somebody else's rice bowl and getting mad at you because, hey, that's mine. Get out. Hey, you partner. I mean, your bestie is a CISA. Your bestie is the chief legal person. That's your bestie. And if it's if they're not, they need to be. You need to go out on a coffee date. <laughs> uh, yeah, on legal, which, which brings up an interesting question on legal because we're seeing an awful lot of concern now with CISOs being potentially in the line of fire from both legal and exactly. criminal as well as civil stuff. With whom would you have the conversation and sit down and said, hey, I, I want to be covered on this insurance policy. If I got a lawyer up, I don't have two or three million dollars sitting around, even if it turns out to be spurious. And eventually the government says, yeah, sorry, we our bad. Well, you're, you're broke. So if somebody's in a CISO position and they are not covered by the organization's insurance, what? strategy would you use to go to them? Do you just say, you know, how are you going to hold my breath till I turn blue? Or No, we, don't, we do not need any more blue ceases. Uh, I, I think, and I hate to use this answer because it's a very consulting answer, but it depends. It depends on 
your environment. So I had a very close relationship with the chief privacy officer, who was also the deputy uh, general counsel at my last place. I would go to her. However, you may not have that kind of relationship. So figure out who you have that type of relationship with, because there has to be at least one person, hopefully. If not, then you're not in a very good, good environment. But find that person you can have these conversations with. I think it differs by the 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 the, the group that you're in. I mean, the, the company that you're in. It could be anybody. But I do want to go back real quick to the board conversation. Okay. That's okay? Yes. Because rolling it up, I have a... I have a way that's helped a lot of people in rolling up those on the ground technical initiatives to the business. And it's fairly simplistic. And what you have to remember is for everything you do, just like in life, everything you do, there is an immediate impact that results that you see right away, hopefully good ones. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then two to three years down the road, there's the strategic impacts. The strategic impacts are how sea levels think. They think in those. They don't think in the immediate. So for everything that you do, there are six business drivers that you should align with. Um, and you pick one. And the first one is uh, increasing revenue. That's what sea levels love to talk about. That's how they think. Second one is decreasing costs. Third one is being able to scale. You scale globally, you know, mergers and acquisitions, all that good stuff. You're able to grow. The fourth one is increase internal automation. Now, I came up with these before ChatGPT really came out, all this AI stuff. But so now with AI, you can really see that one hitting Chrome. Mm -hmm. um, the fifth one is increase customer satisfaction and trust because if you have happy customers they tell their friends that then leads to increased revenue the sixth one which i always leave to last because you should never use it unless you are completely out of ideas and that is can you guess what it is what is the one thing you shouldn't uh you should not it's so cliched as a security person to say well, I mean, you had FUD and things like that, but I'm trying to think of what you would do. Interesting. Um, business driver. Um, so if somebody says to a C ask the CISO, why are, we, why are we spending this amount of dollars on this thing? What is the typical security leader's response? Well, we tend to take a look at it as a, a more of an insurance ROI, like a return on seatbelt investment. Well, nothing happened, so why should we give you more money? And he said, well, nothing happened. And we're saying it's a requirement or it's a cost of doing business. And one of these things that we look at, or if you don't spend that money, we're going to get breached. And then you get into the FUD area. That's, that's it. Reduce risk. Mm -hmm. Right? Why are we doing this? It reduces risk. Right? It's, <laughs> it's the catch-all for everything. But the problem with using reduce risk as an alignment to the business mm -hmm. is, well, one, is cliche. Right. And it is related to FUD, and you don't want to use FUD. Two, they don't think in terms of security risk. They think in terms of financial risk and brand reputation risk and this kind of risk and operational risk. So when you say reduce risk, that means other things to them. So if you take your initiatives and you think three, two to three to five years down the road, each one that you're doing, you're putting an AV. There's going to be an immediate impact, right? A good one. But what's going to happen? What's go what is it going to affect out of those five of the six things, taking out reduced risk? What is it going to ultimately lead to? And sometimes you've got to create this story. And I've often done this where you sit in a big room and you have everybody there and you kind of think, brainstorm. All right, I'm putting in AV. What is that ultimately going to result in? And for your, it, it can vary by your type of company, but an answer might simply be it might increase customer satisfaction and trust. Yeah. And, and that is how you, you, those six, well, five. Yeah. Five uh, drivers 
are how you present what you're trying to do and why to the business. Because then they go, oh, I don't know how AV works. I don't know what it does. I think it's really annoying because it stops me from getting my job done as a big CFO. But ultimately, I see why we're doing it. And, and that's really good insight because you look at these things, increase your revenue, decrease your costs, scale, increase internal automation, or increase customer satisfaction and trust. Those are the big five and the last one, re reducing risk. What happens if it doesn't fit? So for example, I come in there and I say, you know, it turns out that uh, all of our switches are now end of life and we need to replace all of our switches in our, in our rack. And so that's going to need X thousands of dollars, but it's not increasing my revenue. It's not decreasing my costs because the old ones are working. Then I'll be scalped. I'm not adding any seats in the building. I'm fixed there. My internal automation, I've already got control because I've, I've read my Cisco manuals. My customer satisfaction and trust, they could care less what happens at layer two. But I'm reducing the risk of outages, uh, something being hacked because it's an unpatched uh, system, et cetera. And now I'm down there in number six and I don't want to be in six because you had said, right. go there. So how do I, well, I just said it up there? It reduces the chance of it when it improves patching and it reduces the chance of the network going down. Right. Right. So 30 years, three to five years down the road, what does that ultimately reflect in for the business? It's not reducing risk. It's really not. It's you're, you're keeping things going. I mean, you're increasing revenue. How we know revenue is going to go with it or not? If the old stuff might keep running, but the, you know, the, I'm not trying to mince words or argue with you. But the idea was is this: is that a lot of times we're faced with these challenges when we have initiatives that we have to advance, and we go, wait, but, 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 but it doesn't. But Mark, why cram it into that cubbyhole? No, no, no. But honestly, I have had so many people in while I'm presenting this. I've had so many people try to hammer holes into these six and I can come up with a, one of those six or even more for every single situation. Mm -hmm. If you sit in a room and you get a lot of different voices, you can come up with the story as to how it impacts the strategic direction of the company using those six. And that I think is probably going to be the highlight of the show. That's what I'm going to excerpt out there and put like a little, <laughs> How dare <about> you? <laughs> I'm there. I'm going to take you up on it. So what we're talking about that, because one of the things we're thinking about is aligning our strategy with the business drivers. And one of the things that I find sometimes that takes place with technical CISOs or other security leaders is they're not aligned with the business. And the danger there is that you're going to spend, oh, wow, all these lights are blinking over here. This must be the important thing. I'm going to focus on that. And they're getting ready to shut that system down or they're selling off that line of business or they're getting away from it or something you, you don't know about. All of a sudden you find you've been protecting the trash can, which is A, doesn't really help your credibility with the executives, yeah. but B, it means you miss something. So how do we ensure that we stay aligned with the business initiatives and we're not just doing security for the sake of security? Now, everyone's, I'm, real quick, you know, everyone says, talk to everybody, pay attention and so do all these things. There's all, that's all great advice. If you really want to find out what the business cares about, two things you can look at. Job postings. <laughs> Where are they hiring? What areas? Are they hiring in AI? <laughs> right? Are they firing in sales, you know, for uh, hardware? Uh, you know, you look at that. So that gives you a pretty good idea. The second one are word clouds. And I guess you could do it with AI now. Take your website because marketing is going to put it all on the website. What's important to the business right. and do a, do word clouds as how many times certain terms and product names appear. And the more they appear, then obviously they're more important to the business. Mm -hmm. And if they have their own page on the website, they're super duper important to the business. And if, our, if they're on the front page of the website, they're super duper duper important to the business. But do you see what I'm saying? Like, right. Marketing is the first to know. They're the first ones out of the gate. So they're going to update sales materials, go to market materials and website. If they're slow on the website, just look internally at the sales and the go to market materials. Just do word clouds as to how many times certain terms and products appear and services. And that's really good insight. Yeah. Huh? 
Now, I want to circle back on something I made a little note on here earlier when we were talking about insurance for CISOs and are you protected and if not, do you friendly legal? Be CISOs. Do you need any special insurance? Are you sort of, oh, I don't really work here. I'm just a contractor. How do, <laughs> how do you address but that risk? You need to get business insurance right. uh, in coverage. I have $2 million in coverage because I think one of my customers required it. They yeah, same here. $2 million. And so, yeah, so that's, that's why I went out and did. But aside from that, um, I did have a client and it broke my heart because I liked them a lot and they paid me a lot of money. So it was like a bonanza. <laughs> Um, but I had to cut ties with them because they were moving in a direction that was going to introduce a lot of risk. Mm -hmm. And I looked at my contract with them, the statement of work or in the contract, and I was a sitting duck because it, as soon as something happened, they would, they could go after me. There's nothing stopping them. Even though, even if I had nothing to do with it, they would, they could point the finger at me. Mm -hmm. Um, so my advice is, um, Get go to a, uh, an attorney or just check GPT it if you if you want to. Yeah, but use version four. Three point five is not quite as a or use Llama three. I guess that's just came out this past week. It's supposed yeah, to run on Chat GPT four. Or ask a friend, you know, to borrow theirs. But I put uh, non identity and also another paragraph in there that basically saying you cannot come after me. Mm -hmm. You you cannot come after me. There's nothing you can say that I did. Um, I'm not taking the blame. This is and they make sure all the language is mutual. Right. Right. Because a lot of them like to make it one sided on purpose. Um, and I don't take on clients unless they agree to those terms. And I think there's a lot of wisdom there because what we find out is that when you're starting a small business, particularly when you first get going, you hang out your shingle. You might have one customer that you brought with you, so to speak, but there's a desire to kind of get that pump primed. And then you got to be careful that you're not going to end up in a bad deal. And the bad deal could be there be somebody who is, doesn't end up paying you or has no intention of paying you in the first place or whatever, or you find on the other side where there's the whole liability thing. Loads. Yes. And, and both of those are pitfalls for- It's not worth it. It's not worth the risk to take on a client. Yeah. And, and, unless they're willing to sign something like that. It's some clients you need to fire. Uh, it yeah. sounds strange. Why would you fire your customer? Well, there's there's a lot of business school that talks about that. It says your top, your bottom 10% of your customers may cause 70 to 80% of your customer service issues. Yeah. Really just want to focus on these people and it just off it goes. And yeah. like that. Which is what I do. I love all my clients. I love everything I'm doing. Um, life is good. I mean, I think at the beginning, you're hanging your shingle. Mm -hmm. you, you are at a predicament where you, you need to take on business. You need to get your name out there and, and make money. So you can't really require things as much. You don't have that. You don't come from a place of stress. Um, all I have to say is that it's not worth it, the, taking any kind of risk with that. Um, however, I understand if people would because they need to make money and they need to feed their kids go hungry for some reason. I don't know. They like to eat. Oh, yeah. So you got to feed your kids. But the good news is, if you, you're successful and you're good at what you do, you can then start more choosing your, your clients. Right. And that's a very good point, is that after a while, success begets success. Mm -hmm. And what you'll find out is that you earn your own service reputation. Yeah. And so what happens is that over time, someone might try, oh, well, she's brand new or he's brand new. They know what they're talking about. But if you start to show accomplishment, one thing that I kind of wonder about is how valuable have you found or have you even tried to do this are testimonials. So years ago, back in the 90s, I worked with a company that if you were able to get a client to go ahead and say nice things about the company, they would give you, I don't know, like 500 bucks, 1,000 bucks. It's a lot of money back there in the 90s. And you went to corporate headquarters and all these I love you messages, all the I love your company, I love your company. <laughs> How valuable is that in a small business? Do people actually pay attention to that stuff? You know, it's, it's funny. I thought testimonials were going to be the thing. I, I really did. I, I worked hard on getting testimonials. And I was, it's fun laughing because I was talking about this this morning with somebody who wants to be a BC. So, and I said, the saying on the street is, the worse your website is, the, <laughs> the better the consultant you are. I mean, that is the direct correlation. 
And I think I'm in because I haven't updated my site. <laughs> I still work. I still work like I'm 35 years old. There, so. yes, but you, that's a sign that that you're doing very well because you're not focusing on it. I had the most awful website. I thought it was great. I loved it. It was pretty and it was green and coral and it had all these words and I, everything that I could do is on there. And I had it for about a year and a half. And mm-hmm. I looked at it the other day. And I had all these testimonials too. And I looked at it the other day and I went, oh my God, I can't. So basically I just redid it really quick. It's now one page, <laughs> got rid of all those colors. Um, but I, I kept the testimonials on there. But to answer your question, your what matters more than testimonials is your brand, your reputation that goes with that, and your easiness to work with and the quality of your work Mm -hmm. because every deal I've gotten has been through my network. I haven't spent a penny on marketing and I'm sure you haven't either Mm -hmm. unless you count web hosting, you know, for my website Um, because there's no need to people. If your if your brand is solid and you really work at it Mm -hmm. and you're good to people and you help the industry out, it will come back to you. People will, people know, know me, know what I do. If somebody says, I need someone to help with a board deck, they'll go, oh, yeah, I think, I'm sure Olivia could do that. And, and that's a pretty good thing because you live by your reputation. And yeah. they think about it. Yeah, I've got some keynotes that I've done this year. They came looking for me. And it's like, how'd you guys find me? And it's like, well, somebody told me about you or someone know about that. And, and so that's a very, very good insight is that, build that service reputation. In the military, we had something we called a service reputation. And so what that meant was it wasn't necessarily what you had on your ribbon rack. To a certain extent, once you learn how to read them, you can very quickly decode them to say, yeah, this is first one, some juice, or this is just a hanger on her. But beyond that, you'll find out that it's a small enough community that the more senior you get, the more people know about you and who you are and what to expect. And then you get entrusted with things. Yes. So this has been a, a fun thing. And we're almost at the end of our show. You know, we're coming up on 45 minutes. So any last thoughts you'd like to conclude with or recommendations or ideas for people that you'd like to leave them with before we finish up here? I, I think I, I speak with a lot of people who want to make the jump from CISO to VCSO cause, or, or to whatever, consulting, running their own gig. And because they're just so burnt out and exhausted. Mm-hmm. And now all these extra requirements and fears are now on their plates. And I can tell you that it's it's worth it. There's lots of business out there um, where most people are probably going to not do as well, knowing the typical CISO, is the sales and marketing part. The, mm-hmm. you, gotta, you gotta talk about yourself. You gotta get out there and do presentations. You, you gotta put yourself as a brand. Oh. Many don't know how to do that or are comfortable doing that. In that case, if you're one of those people, there's nothing wrong with that. Get some help to do that because your brand is everything. Uh, don't spend the money on the website. Don't spend on marketing. Spend it on figuring out who you are as a brand because it's so worth it. I mean, I was so burnt out when I left my last place, that I was a shell of myself. I mean, I, I didn't even know who I was. And it took me several months to get over that. But now, when I look at myself versus two years ago, I'm a completely different person. And I think that's a really good insight is for folks to say, if you're not feeling yourself. Yes. And sometimes you get bent out of shape by just trying to conform either requirements that are something you disagree with or just too many or excessive, uh, there, there is an alternative. But don't just jump out and figure, I'm just going to put my name out there in the world, yeah, yeah, yeah. my door. It has to be deliberate. And find a mentor. Find somebody who has done it before, who is willing to go ahead and help you out. And I think you'll find then that you get a really good result. And then your future can be as exciting as yours is. <laughs> so, I want to thank you for being part of CISO Tradecraft. Olivia Rose, if you want, someone wants to learn more from you or they want to get in touch with you, what's the best way to reach you? Uh, probably LinkedIn. I think okay. it's Olivia Rose Cybersecurity. Okay, on- that's like a good way to find it. And yeah. if you can do that for CISO Tradecraft, you can find us on LinkedIn. If you're not following us already, do so. You'll join over 31,000 
followers that are getting not only the podcast, but our updates that we put out on a nearly daily basis. That'll be the important cybersecurity stuff you need to know. And if you're not watching this episode, come on and subscribe over here on YouTube as well so you get to see my smiling face and my guests once in a while. <laughs> but until next time, I want to thank you for being part of the show and being part of our audience. And until then, stay safe.